if you invest in Interplay as a VC fund or KKR as a private equity fund or any of the hedge funds or real estate, you're probably managing this information in a spreadsheet that you physically update. And you probably are logging into various portals like Carta and Interlinks to pull down documents and data from those portals. We automate all of that kind of work to get the private markets up to the same level of digitization as public markets as a platform like Fidelity. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay. On this podcast, I interview innovators about their strategies, industries, and decisions. This week, I chat with Ryan Eisenman of Arch, a tech-enabled service platform that helps private investors collect all of the super annoying paperwork associated with their investments. Collecting statements, tax documents, and legal documentation from private markets has become an absolute nightmare for people who are investing in a lot of these different funds. And Arch has made a really easy solution to help with that. He interestingly, in this conversation, compares the admin of private markets today to what it used to be for public companies back when they used to issue paper stock certificates. It is totally, totally antiquated. Their modern technology tentacles into dozens of platforms to centralize the data flow and makes it super easy to get the information you need about your investments. Um, it's a really interesting conversation. We discuss, discuss the Arch solution, startup lessons, and we get into the fairness of the investor accreditation laws in the United States. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Chelsea Capital. Chelsea Capital provides high quality, low-cost accounting, tax, CFO, and alternative finance solutions. For those who don't know, alternative finance solutions include venture debt and other forms of non-dilutive capital. They help companies scale their operations while keeping costs low. If you're interested in learning more, visit chelsea.capital. Ryan, awesome. Thanks for being here, dude. Mark, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's start off. Can you give us an overview of your company? Let's start at the top. Starting at the top. All right. So we are what we call a digital admin for private investments. So what does that mean? What this means is there are a lot of solutions today to manage your public market investments. Uh, So you could use something like Charles Schwab, a Fidelity account, Robinhood, work with any of the major banks. And it's a pretty digital uh, experience where if you kind of look at the flow of what people used to do to manage public market investments, People used to have to handle their physical stock certificates for Coca-Cola shares and keep track of how many shares they owned and their cost basis and do that all manually. Uh, So we're living in the world where that manual work is fully true for people who are investing in private market investments today, uh, where if you invest in Interplay as a VC fund or KKR as a private equity fund or any of the hedge funds or real estate, you're probably managing this information in a spreadsheet that you physically update. And you probably are logging into various portals like Carta and Interlinks to pull down documents and data from those portals. We automate all of that kind of work to get the private markets up to the same level of digitization as public markets as a platform like Fidelity. Uh, So we'll aggregate clients' data, show them a single dashboard that tells them what they own and how their investments are performing, collect their K1s for them, and manage other parts of the administrative headache that they used to have to manage. I think the first time I saw a stock certificate, it was framed, Mm -hmm. right? But back in the day, that was basically currency, right? You got the stock certificate, it was worth something. It was just a piece of paper, right? We'd love to do the same thing with their K-1s. Like, be like, have your children say, the first time I saw a K-1 and the only time was that it was framed. But now my tax information just flows directly into my tax return. Right. And the folks who are out there doing these private market investments and these private equity funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, They've all got different portals. I'm an active investor. I've got, I don't know, 30, 40 portals I log into to download one document. Different logins, they're all a mess. This is a real administrative nightmare. Real administrative. Is is there a part of the uh, solution at Arch that is the most popular or the most significant thing that kind of gets people hooked, right? You talked about ingesting the K-1 data, um, and K-1, you know, is, is the tax filing, right, that the company's giving to its investors so that they can flow that information on the tax return. Are the, the, the monthly or quarterly financials, is there a particular thing that people gravitate most towards, or 
is it kind of everyone's just sick of all the paper in general? Because it's not paper, it's PDFs. Yeah, I'd say there's like three things in particular. And we think of this as a bundled approach where some people care a lot about just understanding what is the total universe of everything that I own. And I've heard at least three or four dozen times this exact sentence of, if I get hit by a, a bus, my wife, husband, spouse wouldn't have any idea of what we own or where to find my investments. So I need a, a source of truth for that information. Uh, the second thing is logging into all the portals. So when people get a capital call request or an update letter, we find that a lot of times people won't read the letters. They will, of course, get a capital call because that's necessary, but they won't do the other things um, because of the extra admin work to do so. So we put those no- those notices back in their inbox. They actually don't even have to log into our platform. We'll give them a direct link to the notice. And then the third thing really is collecting all of their K-1s and other tax documents, uh, giving those directly to their accountant so they don't have to track those down or follow up with missing documents. Uh, so that's probably the one that actually the last one is the most painful and, and provides the most value. Okay, so just to make sure I understand the experience, um, an investor goes in, they set up on Arch, and they then individually log in to all these different portals. You guys set your, t- your hooks into those portals and pull out all the documents and then email them to the right people. And I'm assuming maybe store them on the web. Is that the right? Uh, very close. So we have a digital way of connecting to all the different portals like Carta and Interlinks. So when we set up their, their account, we'll set up all those connections on behalf of the client once they sign up for Arch. Uh, then everything that we receive will be posted into the Arch platform. So we go from many logins to a single login. Uh, so it's kind of like single sign-on in a way. All that information is organized within Arch. And then we'll send either a daily or weekly summary email to the client where they, in that one email, have everything laid out of these are the capital calls coming due and all the other items that you've received with a direct link to the document. So you can, of course, go into Arch to get that document, but you can also click directly from your email in the same way that you might have before had an attachment to an email. So kind of bringing that old paradigm back. So we use Carta as our fund admin for Mm -hmm. Interplay. Um, And I'm familiar with Interlinks and all the others. But there seems to be a proliferation, dozens of these Mm -hmm. tiny little home start uh, fund admin platforms out there that probably the tech behind them does not look very sophisticated. The product and user experience is not very good. Do they have the necessary APIs for you to hook into? Or are you guys limited right now to the big players that have built proper technology behind their systems? Uh, So even the big players mostly don't have APIs. Uh, so we're yeah. actually working. Yeah. Carta actually hasn't even released their API yet. Um, Whoa. And so we are working proactively with providers like Carta and some of the other fund admins to build the first of its kind APIs. And in the meantime, we'll do you know, whatever we need to of different kinds of scraping and different kinds of data extraction in order to get information from all the different platforms. And part of the promise to our clients and part of the way that we architected this is we need to from day one be able to pull 100% of the information that clients need. So we work with every portal, big and small. Mm. And do you have a, what's, what's the error rate, right? Like when you're scraping information, usually machines tend to make mistakes 1% of the mm-hmm. time, some small percentage. Is that, is that part of the program or have you guys been able to get around that? Yes, yeah, so we think about this the same way that uh, Tesla thinks about errors, where using a Tesla, there should be significantly less errors than a human driver. Now there are still errors every now and then, um, but you can find each error and be like, okay, now we need to identify this as a car, not as a billboard or kind of readjust the algorithm. Uh, Part of the way that we keep errors extremely low is we have this proprietary set of data checks that checks every piece of information that comes in across uh, the entire platform. And anything that is flagged as any kind of anomaly uh, will also be flagged to a human reviewer. And so we can put human eyes on anything that has any chance of being an error uh, or that's flagged by our system to make sure that errors stay low. That's awesome. Okay, very cool. So where does this product go in the future, right? I know you've got this baseline ingesting all of the alternative asset data out there and delivering it to the right people. Where, where, do, you, yeah. where do you see this running? So there's so much more that is painful for people today. Uh, in managing their investments, and especially everything that touches their private investments. Uh, a good example that we hear repeatedly from clients is clients that have 30 to 40 different kinds of funds or institutions that have a lot of funds, 
are constantly calling bankers, submitting wires, uh, and completing wire requests. And this is something where people are also constantly afraid that they will get the wrong instructions, that they'll have to deal with some kind of fraud, that they might send money to uh, someone that is defrauding them. And so we think that there are really good ways to solve those and other kinds of scalable problems that investors deal with. Uh, the subscription pro- problem is pretty strong. Uh, luckily, there are a couple of people solving this from the GP perspective, but we think that there's some need to be able to work with all those different providers. Reporting and reporting data is something that we've been doing a lot more of, of getting data into platforms like Adapar and Black Diamond and some of these other reporting systems. So kind of in that way, being like a plaid for all of this data. And then there are a lot of other use cases, whether it's estate planning or different kinds of financial product access or optimizations around fees or cash flow that we think will be able to really help our clients deal with. Um, and then also help them connect to the right service providers in certain ways. So this can be kind of the basis of a hub for their financial lives. Got it. This is a big technical lift, just because you have so many different nodes you have to plug into here. Um, uh, who's a customer is. for this? Who's a customer for this? Is it, uh, you know, go ahead. Uh, so at the center, kind of our median customer is some version of a private investment firm. And uh, in that bucket are family offices and fund of funds and others that have dozens to hundreds and in some cases, thousands of different private investments. Uh, we also work pretty closely with institutional wealth managers. So that could be the independent REA or multifamily office all the way up to major banks. And so we have kind of a very large U.S. bank that we're working on a pilot with. Uh, and then we also work with individuals. So individuals that have dozens of investments or more that are looking for a single dashboard and looking to automate that work away. Uh, along with some early work with a couple pensions and endowments and institutional investors of that ilk. Such an interesting market because I'd imagine a market that's as concentrated as this, the customer acquisition strategies are maybe a little bit different than what you'd see from obviously a direct consumer product. How do you guys go out and think about acquiring customers? So the biggest channel for us today is uh, direct referrals. So our clients will probably on average refer us to three people in their network that we can help that either have a similar profile to them or are kind of a different participant in the market. What we're starting to see a lot more of also is someone who will come in as an individual user of the platform. They'll have an investment advisor or an accountant that they use. They'll add that advisor or accountant as users on their instance of the platform. And then those advisors will start to see the platform and then might say, I want to roll this out across our entire advisor group. This is something that we just saw happen with another group this last week. Uh, So we love those examples because we love when we can have product-led growth, where we grow because our product fits a use case and because people naturally feel like they can share it and help someone in their network. The other major channel for us is referrals. Um, So we have programs set up with a couple of the major banks and some other fintech companies where they bring us into conversations because we unlock value for their clients. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I think the the virality component of this seems kind of intuitive, given that there's all these stakeholders that are all interwoven with each other, right? Yeah. Someone's accountant ends up serving other people and probably recommends it. Are there yeah. are there marketing or sales activities you guys do to kind of support that, or you're you just kind of focus just on the virality? Um, so there's a little bit more that we want to start doing on the marketing side. Um, one of those areas is we have some great customers who and these clients have really interesting experiences that we'd love to be able to share with others. Uh, So we're going to start working on ways to partner with our clients on bringing great content to our other clients and really kind of surfacing some of this knowledge out in the world. Uh, As we recently did a webinar with a client that went to space, was on one of the Blue Origin flights, and we're going to start putting out uh, a couple articles from that conversation and think that can be the bedrock of a lot of our strategy of, of creating really like differentiated content, things that people want to hear about, knowledge that's hard to find, and being able to like lift everyone's ability to learn uh, through some of these conversations. So I look at this type of business and I think, wow, this has got to be really hard just because you've got so many different players that you have tech dependency on, right? If someone changes their API, you've got to tweak yours, your uh, software interface with that, right? There's all these different nodes and that's the value. Right, you're doing all mm-hmm. the hard work for everybody and centralizing that. Um, what has been the biggest challenge for you in creating this business? Uh, so, biggest challenge probably has been getting to the burden of proof of what you need to sell into this industry. And so, mm-hmm. I'd say that took maybe about two, two and a half years of the kind of early stage of our company, and sort of to split 
our company's trajectory into two parts. It'd be pre-burden of proof and post-burden of proof. Uh, pre, what we needed to do is we need to get things like a SOC 2 audit. Uh, so an industry standard of you are secure, you're treating this data in a secure way, you're doing what's needed to make sure that this data, which is really important to clients, stays private and stays secure. That was important along with the right sales collateral, the right visualization within the platform. And then I think referenceable clients uh, is extremely important as well. If you're an endowment who's purchasing Arch, you want to know that Harvard, Yale, or Stanford is using the platform, and then it's an easy purchasing decision. And the same is true for family offices and multifamily offices and anyone else. You want to know that someone who you consider uh, an aspirational peer or someone that you respect or trust uses this platform, and that makes the purchasing decision a lot easier, which is why probably most of our sales motion is driven by referrals and the people are able to become clients quickly once they know, oh, my good friend Mark, he uses Arch. And I trust him and he's had a great experience. So how did that affect fundraising for you? Because I think this is one of the, the newer trends in the venture community. You know, historically, venture was the asset that entrepreneurs would turn to to kind of fund that J-curve gap, that period when yep. they were building out a technology before they could really get to market and start generating tons of revenue and crushing and the whole thing. Uh, but the cost of development has become so cheap that I think that a lot of early stage VCs now don't really want to fund the J curve anymore. They want mm-hmm. to back companies on day one that are already generating revenue, have some sort of presentable product. Uh, the milestones happen much quicker. So every now and then I bump into these companies that have kind of a normal J curve, a, nor- a normal from a decade ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're a little bit lost in the venture cadence. Did that screw you guys up at all? Or how did that affect you guys? Yeah, I think we were lucky to be a little bit conservative at the beginning. So we knew that it might take a while to get to where this could really start to expand quickly. And so we raised an initial pre-seed round. Uh, We had that capital last us for over two and a half, three years. Uh, And we didn't, when we went to our first like real big round of funding, we didn't need to raise it at that time. We still had the ability to continue to operate, but we were an extremely lean team there. We were five people. Uh, so the three original founders founded the company, two MIT software engineers, we had one additional engineer and one operations person. And so we could sustainably grow at that pace. But we realized that we had something that should see market and that should expand a lot more quickly. Uh, so then we were able to go out and raise uh, a bigger institutional round in order to fuel some of that expansion. So yeah, that, that's, I think, the lesson is just that You've got to make the first round last longer and have a lot of patience. We have a company, I think that, uh, I don't know if the, the timing's exactly right, but it's at least three, four years, same thing, J-curve, to get through to where now they have all the data, the proof points, and they're back on the venture cadence. Um, this is painful for folks, this new expectation around kind of not having a much of a J-curve. It's like an L now. As as it's, yeah. You just kind of go up. Um, okay. Uh, now, when you guys are building out your algorithm, one of the things we hear a lot of people doing with this kind of thing, where they're trying to make the machine smart, not make errors, and you mentioned it a little bit before, is they're balancing uh, the technology with human input. And in some cases, I think we had um, Sam Lesson on before, we might have been talking about Finn or one of the other projects, where we, they started out with mainly human and then phased mm-hmm. technology in over time. How did you guys uh, kind of cadence that? That sounds like you stayed pretty lean. So did you just delay going to market until the technology was there? Or did you use humans in a way that maybe was kind of hidden behind the scenes? Yeah, so we've been really focused on the, what the client experience is from day one. And like that being one of the most important things for us is what is the end user experience? Is it beautiful? Does it scale? Does it make their lives significantly better? Uh, when we built Arch uh, at the very beginning, we were lucky to have two very sophisticated investors and family offices that were our beta clients from day one. And we put software in their hands within two to three weeks. Uh, and mm. the initial software build was highly manual on the back end. Uh, the actual true tech back end for V1.0000 uh, was Google Sheets and Dropbox. And I was putting information Amazing. into Google Sheets and Dropbox. <laughs> and then we would query that to the front end, give it to our clients to be like, hey, Great. how is this? And our, our first solution was, we're going to collect your K1s for you. We're going to give you and your accountant access to this one page, and we'll do all the tracking down of documents. Uh, then we made tweaks. We talked to their accountants. We talked to them. We were on the phone with them multiple times a week, just figuring out, like, how does this work? Does this work for you? 
what do you, what functionality do you need? Oh, you need to know what's new since you last logged in. You need to be able to download. You need to be able to upload. You need to see when things are expected to arrive. And we just very quickly iterated on the product. And that's been our approach since day one of iterating with clients, making software that is intuitive so that when we talk to the next family office or multifamily office or RAA, they feel like we are inside their brain and we've built something that they envisioned. And that's happened on a number of, of instances. Uh, and then we can always continue to automate more things over time. But with this idea, we want to handle 100% of everything that a client would need and then put technology in so that it is as scalable as is possible and as automated. And so both a leader on automation, but also never losing sight of the most important thing is that great customer experience. You have a really uh, developed view of kind of the uh, startup cycle here, the customer development you're doing. How did you get that? You, you know, it sounds like you're coming out the gate with uh, tremendous depth in the right way to build these companies. Thank you for that. Uh, I think it's something that we have just learned along the way. We probably had like four or 5,000 customer conversations at this point uh, and average somewhere in like the six to 10 new customer conversations a day. And so I think that's where we learn the most. Uh, of course, we listen to podcasts like yours and try to learn from the smartest people out there who have already done these kind of things before. And then we, we've been lucky to have great investors, advisors, and mentors along the way as well, uh, and can surround ourselves by people that we can truly learn from. Okay, right on. All right, let me be candid with you. Arch, you're doing admin processing for people's investments. It is not the sexiest thing on earth. Is it important? What gets you out of bed uh, to solve this problem? Yeah, so this is why we think it's important. And when we started this, uh, I met my co-founders through this guy, Lee. Um, and Lee introduced me to my co-founders being like, hey, you guys are interested in a similar area. They also want to build something that matters to people, but isn't sexy. Uh, that's an overlooked, underloved problem. And probably if you were to survey all the top engineers coming from all the top engineering schools, and you ask them, okay, is admin for private investments, one of the top 20 problems that you want to solve. I would guess that it's <laughs> not on that list. Uh, uh, strong hell no, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's part of the magic here is that people who built software companies or companies in the space before haven't been able to combine for most of, in most cases, and there are definitely some notable um, uh, counter examples here. People haven't been able to combine like really great engineering with customer obsession with private investments and alternative investments. Uh, and we think that there really are like all these things that are painful for people to solve and things that are huge productivity um, sucks for people who have a lot of demands on their time and are extremely sophisticated and are really costly and often lead to suboptimal outcomes. Because uh, when we set out to build this company, we were also kind of thinking about this as like, Sometimes you need to start at the end or you need to like invert what you're the way that we're thinking about building this company of uh, what we want to do ultimately is help people have better outcomes. Like we want people to make better financial decisions to pay less in fees and have better outcomes and be able to uh, protect, preserve and grow capital over time. We realize in order to do that, you have to have really good data. And in order to have really good data, you have to have great processes and these processes are painful. So we started with let's automate these processes, then give people good data. And then ultimately, that should lead to better outcomes. I love that. I can hear the passion in your voice. It's funny Thanks. for this topic, but I'm glad someone's doing it. It's important. Um, what's been the best part of the journey for you? I mean, you've been at this for a bit now. What's, uh, yeah, what's made this thing? I think the best part is the unprompted feedback from our customers uh, when they view the platform for the first time or when they're sharing their experience with us and they'll give us this just like amazing bite size uh, quote of how they love the platform and how it's changed their experience and changed something about the way that they live or the way that they manage their investments. And we'll try to bring those to our team. We have a team meeting every week. And the one of the biggest portions of our team meeting is going through these kind of customer quotes and sharing that kind of feedback. Uh, and it is like the fuel that keeps us going of hearing how we're able to help customers with these types of problems. I love that. Now, how'd you get here? Give us a little overview of your background. Like what was your, your journey to show up and start doing this? Yeah. So in college, I studied a bit of like essentially as close to business as you could at a liberal arts school. Uh, and then studied what my major was, was human and organizational development. So it was a lot around 
how people interact, how teams are built, how problems are solved, and how you uh, create change within organizations. Uh, while I was in college, in, interned for an investment advisor. My dad was also a financial advisor, so got to see this perspective through two different lenses. Saw some of those things that were pretty manual and intensive and unpleasant for a lowly analyst or an intern to do. So I was doing a lot of that kind of work and then kind of stored that in the back of my mind. Uh, went to go work a consulting job out of school as most people do uh, out of, or maybe not most people, but as a lot of people do out of college. And That's what I did. Real, uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. just following in your path, Mark. Uh, <laughs> And then I I realized after a summer in Tel Aviv that there's just a ton happening in the uh, technology sphere and that that's where I felt like big incremental changes were happening and wanted to be involved in tech. So left the consulting firm, went to go work for a startup, ultimately found myself at Techstars working for Techstars for a few months. And then out of Techstars, we had this idea, uh, really was validated with that mentor, Lee. And then with my two co-founders, we came to conviction that this is something that we wanted to build and turn into a company and haven't looked back since. That's awesome. Now, there's some other parts of the story you left out. We did a little digging on you. Uh, tell us about your wilderness experience. Oh, yes. Um, so I think this is one of like the first times that I like, truly learned how to really plan ahead and how to handle an entire like mission from beginning to end. Because uh, for two years before going to college, I led wilderness trips for eight to 15 year old boys at a, a camp. And these were three to 10 day trips. And I was in some cases just two years older than them at 17. And most of my co-leaders or pretty much all my co-leaders were a fair bit older as well. Uh, so that was probably one of the best experiences for me in terms of like maturity. And I learned how to cook on these trips. I learned how to plan and how to like what North meant versus South and how to find a trail and how to navigate. Uh, and also how to like, manage a team and manage people's happiness. And even if you're caught on the side of the river for two hours, as there's a crazy thunderstorm with eight year old kids who are extremely unhappy and cold, how you can like find joy in those moments, uh, the storytelling that you do to kind of create meaning there and the way that you can take something that could otherwise be a really negative experience and turn it into a growth experience for myself and for everyone else on the trip. It was literally just this past week talking with some folks about the idea of uh, putting our kids into a program or something like this. The idea of kind of getting them out uh, a couple of weeks. And I was dreaming of something pretty raw where they don't have a lot of resources. It's not, not glamping, but, you know, resetting kind of what it means to be safe and independent. Uh, I think it's a very powerful thing. I was assuming I you would recommend that. Yeah, this was a, a great camp. And then there are programs like Knowles uh, National Outdoor Leadership School. I did one of their month-long trips where you're fully in the wilderness for a month. Uh, I think those are incredible programs and you get to explore a different side of you and learn skills in a fully different setting. Very cool. I'm going to take notes after this uh, conversation. Yeah, happy Much to chat more. on that. Of course. Um, okay. It's, and so along the way, I mean, it sounds like you've picked up a lot of the startup tips. You have mentors. Who was who coaching you? Where did this, how'd you figure all this out? Uh, so this initial guy, Lee, has been a big coach for us. And he was someone that we met with every week when we were first getting started. And then as we started to um, kind of remove the training wheels and be able to work on our own, uh, have still continued to keep in touch with and most recently did like a three hour deep dive session into product and product market fit and some of the things we were doing. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of our clients have become mentors because our clients oftentimes are people that are really passionate about managing their investments, or, but are also are passionate about entrepreneurship. And many of them have done this before and want to see the next generation succeed. And so we're extremely appreciative to the time that they've given us, uh, both kind of from a business advice perspective, as well as like time focused on product. Uh, and then, of course, we, lo we look to other entrepreneurs and VCs and other people in this industry. And, and I think it's amazing how people and how willing people are to share time, share perspective, and help us see around corners. Are, are there bits of wisdom that you've taken from mentors or your own personal experience? Maybe, you know, what's the most important thing you've learned as a founder? Let me put it that way. Yeah. Um, I think, so most important thing we've learned as a founder 
is just like how much it matters to be obsessed with customers and how much we can learn from all the people around us. Uh, and so mentors aren't the o- only source of knowledge. It's also our team and like having an incredible and focused and dynamic team is extremely important. And having great advisors and friends and uh, being able to like read great knowledge and pull knowledge from all these different sources. So then for us as founders and as those trying to build a company, we want to be we want to learn as quickly as possible. And I think a lot of success is how quickly you can learn what you need to do and then how you apply hard work and effort behind that learning. Uh, so it's kind of this continual approach. And, and I think we really learn from those around us, from being willing to make little mistakes and, and learn along the way and being introspective enough to know when things aren't perfect, how we can learn from those experiences and know that every day you get a chance to continue to push the ball forward. And I think a lot of times growth and progress happens in really big spurts. So you might not see on a daily basis how much progress you're making, but then you might have a period where it's like a week or a month where you have a series of great conversations, you nail a big client, you learn a lot from them. And then from that learning and from kind of the way that you and the team grow, you are then a different company and you're on a different playing field. uh, And you now have kind of an enhanced view of what you need to do. And knowledge can continue to compound on itself. Uh, And that's probably one of my favorite things. I love that answer. I'm in the process of writing an article right now um, for publication. And the question I'm answering is, what are the character traits that make someone successful as an entrepreneur? What are you looking for? And I, the way they had worded it, I think they were looking for you know, people who have certain degrees or certain backgrounds. It wasn't character traits. Uh, my response is basically grit, you know, uh, curiosity. And humility. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, you know, what, what you're talking about right now is really just realizing that you can always be learning. You know, I feel like I'm constantly learning from everybody around me. Um, and if you have that mindset, it, it's a game on. You're just so much more effective in these startups. There's too many things out there. It's impossible to know it all. So I, I love that mindset when I'm hearing people talk about that. I'm like, okay, ding, indicator of probable success. Um, so, I'm not surprised you guys have gotten as far as you have uh, when you're singing that tune. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, okay, cool. So what does the industry need, right? You're out, you're fixing uh, a lot of the admin flows. I know that the scope of this is going to continue to expand for you. For other people listening who could be helping the cause of you know digitizing something that should have been digitized 20 years ago, uh, what, should, what needs to be done? What should be public? Yeah, I mean, definitely designers. Uh, so that's like the very quick answer. Is there a lot oh of? Oh my god! Yeah, a lot of different workflows that are really difficult, and that no one thought about, like what the person on the other side, and these are people on the other side, like what they actually have to do to fill out a subscription document, or to make a wire request, or to log into a portal. And sometimes it's impossible to find the document you're looking for in some of these portals. So thinking about the user experience and the interface that that clients will log into, I think is extremely important. So what that brings me to is just generally customer obsession, like understanding what a customer needs and diving deep into those needs and trying to figure out, okay, what are you actually trying to do? And why are you trying to do it? And can we build something that saves you 10 clicks, makes your life significantly better and helps you better understand this information. And some of this information may be opaque by design. Like there are definitely terms hidden in subscription documents and in other types of documents that maybe aren't meant to be understood. But I do think that if there was more transparency here and and some of this information was better understood, you'd ultimately have better outcomes for both the LP and the GP and all the service providers uh, who are helping uh, with these processes as well. Okay, that's, that's a given. This market's a mess, and I think there's a lot of opportunity. I'm interested to see if this solution ends up being a lot of little companies or one company that kind of makes the platform here. So maybe that'll be you guys. So we'll see. Uh, one question for you, right? The, um, your customer is high net worth folks, right? That's whether they're family offices or individual investors. Uh, U.S. law requires folks investing in these alternative assets to be accredited investors. I think that means $200,000 of annual income as an individual, 300 if you're a couple, and it's one to two million of net worth excluding a house. 
So more or less by all kind of a normal American income distribution, these are rich folks. Um, how do you feel about the accredited investor laws when you're so close to this? You know, there's some controversy in this. I know they were designed to help protect investors, but one of the challenges I have ethically when I see it is a lot of the best yields and returns are tied up in these private asset investments, these alternative assets. And, you know, they, in the right groups, you outperform the public markets by a lot, but they're not accessible to everybody. What's your take on the paradigm we've got set up? Yes. So two things before I dive into this question. Uh, one thing is we, we do serve predominantly more complex investors today, but we do also serve like teachers and other pensioners through our institutional investor product. And then we think what we're building here on the private market side can also help those with a lot less sophistication over time. So we think that like there is a big aspect of this democratization of private assets and more people having access to them and more people then needing to manage them. That can be a big part of our story in the future. And so that's part of kind of our long term vision. I think the accreditation uh, laws in a lot of ways are serve a, a very valid purpose of making sure that people don't get defrauded out of their money. Um, but it's something that technology one can help solve. And I think it's it's definitely not a perfect way to to govern uh, this market. So what we would love to be able to see, and definitely our clients who would kind of fit into that accredited and sophisticated bucket are oftentimes faced with investment decisions that are subpar as well and oftentimes end up with operators where if they had more information or had a better way to get information, they might be able to avoid instances of fraud or instances of like really risky investments where they can lose money. Uh, so we'd like to play a role in this probably in two ways. One, in standardizing the way that people look at and manage these investments to be able to uh, know uh, what's a good investment versus a bad investment, better understand the risk tolerance and potential for risk and make good decisions. And then we would love to either see or be part of seeing these laws change so that these asset classes, which have historically seen better returns, are accessible to all investors who um, are looking for those kind of risk-adjusted returns. Uh, and so I, I completely agree. There needs to be more reform here. And there's been a little bit, but I think it, it's kind of crazy that many of our employees who uh, are extremely sophisticated and understand this world very, very well, uh, also can invest in private market investments. And that just fundamentally doesn't make sense because they are at the front lines of building the software to create how these investments are managed and how they're handled. What the government's using is a proxy of, they're trying to figure out who's sophisticated. And what they said is if you're already pretty rich, you can take risk and get richer and get access to the things that make everyone the most money. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a catch-22 for folks. What If you were king, how would you amend the, the construct and the laws? Was there a certain, would you open it up to everybody or would there be certain rules around who can, who can be accredited, but maybe under, maybe not something tied to financials? Yeah, maybe it'd be something akin to how we um, do driver's education, where mm. you have the right to drive and it's not based on your income level and driving is a great benefit to all people and driving has risks. There are car accidents, um, but driving definitively is a good thing for everyone and for society, uh, but you need to learn how to drive first. So maybe there's a like a, a course you can take uh, that teaches you how you, and, and this could be something where there's min minimum requirements, but different private companies can create their own courses uh, in order to serve that population. And maybe there's some public course as well uh, that allows you to learn enough about these investments to be able to understand the inherent risks and how to allocate assets. And, and it ultimately is a tricky problem. Because ultimately, some people, when they invest in alternative investments, will lose money. Uh, and I think that's a given. And there is yeah. risk and there are recessions and there are times where everything goes down and there's times where everything goes up. Um, so we have to be aware of that. But, but I think it's not fair to exclude everyone from these investments uh, just to protect a few people as well. Yeah, maybe a test. Um, yes, and maybe some sort of maximum percentage of net worth per investment. So helping people make sure they don't kind of put all their chips on one bet uh, yeah. if it is open to everybody. Certainly seems reasonable. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate you being here. Mark, thanks so much. This was a ton of fun. Really appreciate you having me. 
So while that may not be the sexiest subject for many folks listening, I am super grateful for Ryan and his team to go out and solve this problem. Uh, They're going to hopefully streamline this market and make it a lot easier for people to invest. My hope is I'll democratize and and play a role in democratizing access to these investments, uh, which I think will make for a better society. If you like what you heard, please hook us up with a like or a five-star review and feel free to share with a friend. You can find me on Twitter at MPD. And to hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, or any major podcast platform. Just search for innovation with Mark Peter Davis.